So we're going to keep this down to fundamentals because we have enough low tier people that I think is going to be hugely beneficial to everybody here. So we'll yeah. start with a couple main ideas about 5CP. The main way I categorize this type of... What's up, Drago? The main way I categorize this type of stuff is into a rotate and not rotate mids. So let's categorize. Rotate mids. Process. Sunshine. Uh, what's the new one? Reckoner? Reckoner. That's also a rotate mid. Eh. Usual indications is that there's not one central piece of high ground teams fight over. It's more neutral with mirroring high ground. So let's think process, you got crates. Let's think sunshine, you got Tetris. Let's think reckoner, you got crates. And then on the middle, there's some sort of neutral thing that you sort of rotate around and try to get small addition, small advantages, and then collapse the advantage. On non-rotate mids like Gully Wash, Metalworks, Snake, you have a game plan, and then you execute on the game plan. In the case of Gully, the game plan is generate an advantage and then collapse the advantage. An advantage can look like a lot of things. It can be damage. It can be players falling to the floor. Like, for example, if a demo hits a surf but then falls to the floor, that's cause to push across the point and try and kill all of them. Um, that's really sort of the idea. I'll explain in more detail where all the players are playing and stuff, but before we really get into the meat and bones, I want to talk about a couple of basic ideas that I think are important. The first is that TF2 is rock, paper, scissors. I said this a little earlier, but not everyone was here. Scouts shoot soldiers well, soldiers shoot demo men well, and demo men shoot scout well. The balance of those three classes interacting with each other is the dry fight minigame. Demo men are hurt, it usually means scouts are strong, so you try to execute scout things. If the scouts are dead and gone or hurt, usually means your soldier bombs will be better. So you try and work a soldier bomb and push where they're weak. The scouts are hurt, right? Soldier strong, vice versa. You understand how it goes. So the thing about those things as we play the mid are sort of very important. And not just in the mid, but anytime you're not using an Uber, those rules are, should be at the front of your brain, sort of in the way you're approaching and thinking about the fight as it happens. I'm going to skip over the rollout just because there's videos you can look up and in the interest of time, I'm just not going to talk about that. But I will talk about a couple variations on the way you can play this mid and sort of explaining why we're doing what we're doing and then how they reach the end goal. So we'll start with our explosive because on goalie walk, on most non-rotate mids, the important classes are the explosives because they have all the burst, they have all the instantaneous like momentum change. Versus on rotate mid, scout tend to be strong because there's a lot of running around and you can just outpace players as scout. So they tend to be strong. I'm um, starting with our explosives. My favorite way to play this mid is I immediately start with a... Both soldiers and under. And then the reason I do this, we'll start with roamer. I'm going to explain the objectives of the roamer and why he's playing here. The first is... You get good spam on this medic as he walks through, right? Any roamer who's played under can tell you that as this medic walks up, you can usually hit him for 40 or 50. Sometimes you can juggle him. And sometimes you just win mid off juggling that medic with like a ammo mod rocket and he goes straight up and then he eats shit from the demo and he dies. Like sometimes you just win mid doing that. So that's enough reason to play down here. But the second reason he plays down here is because of drop down. Um, I'm assuming we've all experienced it, but in case you haven't, sometimes on this mid, will lose track of a soldier, he'll go up, drop down, be behind the whole team, and kill seven of us, and just lose to one player. Um, so that's a very basic game plan of rolling out right. The mind games, at starting at, I'd say, like IM and above, you can really start playing with this. I'd start, probably say more main. At IM, just wor learning to work drop down, and then not working drop down is good. But as you go high, the mind game becomes, you can just chill lower right, and just the threat of something going up drop down often means they're going to like use some sort of resource to monitor and make sure it doesn't happen. A lot of the times that means there's going to be a pocket not really in the fight sort of chilling watching this drop down, right? We've seen that. So just by playing lower right as roamer, you and you like make them move differently than they normally would and pull resources away from more important things like fighting for point and stuff like that. Just because they have to deal with the threat of losing to the roamer. Um the mind game comes in where you don't necessarily have to go drop down. You can just jump somewhere else. And again, the resources are farther away. So usually it means your point is free. And so you can take good bombs. So that's sort of the idea of roamer. Moving on to pocket. The reason I put my pocket lower left 
is because it helps deal with this whole roamer problem. Like, this guy is really, really strong. He does early damage to my medic. He has potential just to 1v7 us. And he just has a good blind jump coming. Like, this is a very strong position for this player. So, you roll out pocket just to nip that in the butt. So, instead of having a pocket just sitting back here, right, watching it passively, you sort of just tackle the problem a little more aggressively. You roll out lower. You can trade spam games, right, with this guy if you want. All you're really looking to do is really have vision on this guy and make sure that there is or is not a threat here, right? This is really important. Okay, so I'll explain another fundamental soldier concept and that any time you can make a bomb happen in a place, so you start jumping from a place where a scout does not see you, significantly increases your chance of not immediately dying to the scout, right? So I can illustrate, if there's a there, jumping here gets my, like I just died to this guy. But... If I come here, he doesn't see me for as long, so his net reaction time is much lower, right? Like, just the pure time he has to shoot me is smaller. Um, so that's a big idea on Soldier. Anytime you can engineer a jump to be from a blind spot, you definitely should. Um, so that's the mini game our Soldiers are playing. Outside of just making, like, pretending to go drop down, dealing with drop down, the coordination comes in. You both want to take blind into strong positions. Um, a couple of would be things like this. You're in some sort of high ground, and you're in a position where the team has to react and look at you. So, the second part of any sort of collapse base mid, like snake or like non rotate, I call them collapse mids, but they're just not rotate mids. The important thing is that if there's no distraction, there's no way your scouts, medic, and demo can get across these chokes with the demo man. So you're not, coming back to rock, paper, scissors. Your number one priority as a soldier bombing is pressuring on the demo so you can't just sit here and not let the rest of your team come. The main objective of demo man on this mid is make sure things don't walk across the point and throw pipes at scouts so when our soldiers bomb, it's strong. Like That's pretty much the game plan. So by shooting this demo man, you make it so your scouts can get across the point and be effective. Um, so coming back into Demo Man, uh, you kind of know where to play. Everyone sort of plays the same spot. And the reason you're playing here is coming back. Main objective is controlling this point. Little itty bitty chokes. Perfect for stickies. You just, you just roll anything that tries to cross. So that's what you're doing. And then again, if you can tickle scouts with pipes, definitely do that. It just makes your bombs that much better. Coming into scouts, we'll start with flank scouts. Your main objective is to prevent the enemy demo. Let's get rid of the statues. They're kind of weird. Kind of creepy. Um, if you let an enemy demo man on rollout walk up to this ledge and put stickies in this doorway, you've just lost the mid before it started. So to stop the demo man from winning the mid for free, you roll a scout out to the fence, making sure he can't do that. Right? If he wants to try and interact, with my medic walking up, he's not interacting with the scout. He'll just jump up and kill this guy. So right. So this is another big important like concept I want to start you guys thinking about is if you make people make decisions, they can make mistakes. They don't have to think. They're never going to make a mistake. So by doing things like this, where you're not necessarily completely committing to a fight, but you're just in enough to be like a problem if he ignores you, this is where people make mistakes. If you just bot at this guy over and over again, he doesn't have to think. He's just going to shoot pipes at you, right? So playing the more passive intermediary game where he makes a decision on who he's shooting will always benefit you. Um, after you have some immediate pressure things here, if you want, you can continue to aggress on the demo if you feel it's worth it. Sometimes I like to coordinate my flank scout and my flank soldier. The demo is getting too aggressive and the scout's noticing that pattern. He'll tell my soldier to jump, and then we just collapse on this aggressive demo and win the mid off the jump. Um, after you do your immediate things, you're really looking to drop down and either jump into awning or walk up elbow. You're really looking to avoid damage here because you're very isolated. If you get hurt isolated, they might bomb into you, and then that causes a whole chain of events that's probably not good. Because you're in a corner, your team has to like look at the things shooting you in the corner. They start giving up point, it becomes a problem. So really be low profile and just get back to your medic and play second pocket scout. Um, and then sort of positionally, once you're up here, you're really looking to play on this lip towards your medic. Um, 
basically what you're doing is looking to change splash surfaces as often as possible. There's no wall behind you. So they're going to be have to shooting the floor. And so you can do things like this. And now you've completely changed the place where the soldier has to shoot to actually hit you. And then you start shooting again, and you jump back up here and you just play those games. You can jump back out into this out like into space and then jump back if you want. You have all types of games you can play. The main objective is you're shuffling the splash surface on the enemy team as often as possible. As pocket sky, you're just jumping back and forth between these fence posts. Um, I'm gonna take a sort of side note here and talk about in general what a pocket scout sort of is like if there's like a, a, a what's it called a targeting list it sort of goes like this very first at the top is anything that's close to your medic at all regardless of what it is if that motherfucker is close to your medic you're shooting him period the second thing you're shooting is soldiers and good i'll come back to why it's important later but you're shooting soldiers and then the third thing you're shooting is anything that's not the first two um so that is a general sort of list you can be keeping in your head as a pocket scout at all times and it'll usually not lead you astray um so coming back around to why keeping track and looking and shooting at soldiers is important is because the main two separators in my opinion between high skill and low skill players outside of mechanics right like as you get higher and higher the mechanics become less and less discrepancy like at the lower divisions, there's a lot of difference between the really good players and the really bad players. That gap continues to shrink more and more as you get higher and higher in the divisions. It's just like how it works. So the the advantages you gain are like more the mental one. It's the split, in my opinion, is 70% mechanics and 30% brain. Um and some people have fantastic mechanic, but fuck up the last 30% so bad, they just lose to worse players than them. Um, and so the two things that really enable you to be a mental player is first, the ability to keep track of a lot of moving pieces. And what I mean by that is a player who can keep track of Uber is pretty decent. A player who can keep track of Uber and who's alive for both teams is really good. And a player who can keep track of not only those three things, but also where his teammates are at all times is like you're playing a perfect information game. You're playing chess or some shit like you're a God. All right. So that's kind of what you're striving for is to keep as much of the game in your brain as possible. And so for sort of, if we were to make a checklist for that things like of order of importance and things you guys can immediately start working on is first is keeping track of Ubers. If you don't know Ubers without your medic telling you, you should just know. Um, because anytime you can remove asking your medic questions about the state of the game, the faster you can control the game. Um, second thing is who's alive. And the first one you should be paying attention to is who's alive for your team. Um, outside of just who's alive for your team, once you've started keeping track of that almost habitually, moving on to keeping track of who's alive on the enemy team as well, is sort of the third step in the progress. And at this point, you're keeping track of Ubers, who's alive for your team and who's alive for their team. And all of a sudden, you're presented with really three viable options given the information you know, right? So like the more you know about the game, the fewer and fewer of the possible options make sense. And so that's why you can continue to go faster and faster as you keep more and more pe like pieces of information in your brain because there's less options to sift through just because they don't make sense given what you know. So that's like one of the big things that separates players mentally. And sort of the second thing is like, it's almost like a mindset thing. It's understanding what your role is and not trying to do too much. Like a big problem a lot of players have is not, un not even not understanding, but trying to do more than what they're supposed to do. And it starts eating into other people's heels and like just ruin everything. Like having patience and having trust in your teammate, sort of the second mental thing that like holds a lot of players back. So that's pretty much how the mid works. Is there any sort of questions before I start moving on to like holds and pushes and stuff outside of mid? Is there any fundamental questions about rotate, like non rotate mid and about why we're doing what we're doing? No. Uh, I have a question. Please. How, 
in what situation do you decide that I should aggress like right away versus waiting for something to happen? Um, so this is a good question, but okay. So we'll break this down into sort of like a checklist too. So at the very top, the first thing that's an in, like an indicator of like trying to collapse. Actually, we'll word it like this. So what you're looking for is an advantage. And so I'm going to turn the question around on you. What are like, give me two types of advantages that you would like push across. Like if you, if what advantage would your team have that would make you go across? Space and damage. Perfect. You just, you said exactly what I was going to say. So for example, if all their team is playing in the choke back here, this is like a really good sign to commit because they don't control anything and there's walls and you're just going to farm them, right? Versus if they're playing more normally, it disincentivizes you to just start pushing across one by one. Um, second thing is damage slash who's alive. They're sort of the same thing, but they're sort of different, right? Like you could, there's a difference in, oh, they're dead a soldier. Let's fight them 6v5, right? That's a thing. But there can also be a calm where something gets hurt enough to where it makes sense to bomb on it. And this is where the skill gap starts coming in in terms of this decision-making stuff. Um, As a soldier, you're looking to control the demo man if possible, but at the same time, if something gets hurt enough that you can jump, kill it, and then continue to be effective, it makes sense. So for example, if a demo man does 80 to a scout, that's something as a soldier, it clicks in my brain that I should be jumping that guy. Because if I jump that scout while he's weak, I kill him. Not only will everything on the team look at me, but I've just made myself stronger because there's one less scout. You know what I'm saying? Like it's not all about the demo, but there is an advantage there that you could capitalize on, which was, like you said, damage. So let's start talking about how you would hold this mid. And then from how the holds work, we'll move into pushing it. Um, we'll start with the default hold. And in the interest of time, I'll just tell you what it looks like. Um, this is same soldier. It's just possible things he can be doing, right? He's sort of floating around the demo man. The demo man can be getting a beam and peaking aggressive where you can set traps and back up and be slow, right? The important thing here is you want to avoid both of these explosive classes peaking the thing at the same time. Um, peak one at a time, right? If the demo wants to peak, soldier, be in a position to where if something runs at your demo, you're protecting him and demo. If your soldier wants to peak, get off the beam, let him peak and just sticky his floor or set up traps. So if anything peaks him, you can kill it. Work with each other here. Um, pockets. You're in gay baby jail. You're watching drop down. Um, flank. It's playing like this. Um, again, you can get more or less aggressive, but sort of when nothing's happening and we're just chilling as a flank scout, I like to hold my crit heels and just sit here. And then my flank soldier can go get his 300 and start being more aggressive and spotting and sort of communicating to me what he wants to do. Um, and I'll explain why. Because this is such a tight and closed space, you really want this soldier to be the forefront because more likely there's more percentage that a fight will be good for a soldier in this enclosed space than it will be for a scout. So we want this guy to be the first aggressor in this fight. And so that's sort of why you're playing your soldier forward like this and spotting instead of your scout. Um, Cause he'll eat spam less well, but he'll take fights better. And so sort of that's, that's what you're, that's what you're baiting. We'll talk about a dis ad hold. Um, when you're holding this advantage, your demo really doesn't want to die, but at the same time, he's looking to be sticking things that matter. Point. Uh, actually, we'll talk about a couple of sticky spots. Um, forward traps here are really strong. Forward traps in this corner are really, really strong. Forward traps in the electrical box is strong. Fo traps on the front side of this crate are strong because of the way the box works. You actually have to peep these shits really deep to see them. <clears throat> From back here, when you're just walking up, you don't really see them at all. And this happens all the time, and it's a problem. So that's a very strong trap. Um, outside of that, hiding places for soldiers is if you don't. This lamp is standable, and you can just chill here. Um, and the fixed version of Gully, they have it over there too. But this is just final one, so it's asymmetric. Um. As for soldiers, um, if you're both alive, fantastic. You're looking to play a spam. Um, and what I mean by that is instead of 
you're looking to force and you're looking to force in a way that doesn't involve just having a soldier face plant on the medic. And so what the objective becomes if you have both soldiers is you have them stand in relevant spots to where they can escape, right? Like can you put one or you can put one here, right? And then you can shoot this choke together. You can shoot big door together. But if anything happens, right, you can be out. There's avenues for you to leave here and not die. So that's sort of what we're looking to do. And then as the forward soldiers who are spamming together, the common mistake that happens is people will wait for this medic to walk through and then shoot the medic. You should shoot the first player through. If that's a scout, shoot the scout over and over again. If it's a demo, shoot the demo over and over again. Because, coming back to what we're saying, they make decisions, they make mistakes. Do I drop this player? Man, his health is red. Do I pop? I probably shouldn't pop. What if I drop this player? Right? You're making him think. Versus, if you don't shoot this guy and you wait for this medic to walk through, he's just going to chill here until he's done. Versus, you're shooting this guy. He has to heal him. He has to think about pop. The force mm -hmm. happens. So worst outcome, even if he doesn't pop, they drop that player through your player up. You can just retreat a little bit and then fight from second in a better position than you would have. So learning to work, that's sort of an important thing. If you don't have both soldiers, you can do the El Clasico where you just have a soldier hide, right? And then he can spam big door or whatever. And if they come choke, your demo spamming as they walk up and then he jumps in and you force, right? We all know how that works. Um, again, pocket scout. Gay baby jail, you're watching drop down. Um, medic, you really don't want to be walking past the mouth of like elbow, right? So we can imagine an imaginary line, right? Sort of from the front of the barrels to sort of this lip of the door. Medic, I really like avoiding walking past this thing. It just feels like this is a good range. You can touch that guy, you can touch that guy. If that soldier wants heals, he can you can arrow him as he jumps. You have good position, you're in good position. You can, your players are watching everything and you're not forward enough where you're worried about getting juggled in. So this is sort of where you're looking to play. Um, flank scout, if you're alive, um, you're also sort of doing similar pocket scout things. You're really looking not to die um, because a dead flank scout just makes bombs even better and you're already in transition. So scouts dying is horrible. You're sort of just helping with the big door spam and spotting if you want. Um, you can get a buff and be a little more aggressive like on this fence and get a more aggressive peek into big right like you can peek like this and get a more aggressive um and not risk dying so any additional information is always good so now we're going to talk a little bit about pushing theory and the way i think about doors in tf2 um normally in most transitions from a point to another point there's like three entrances into the last one two three we think about snake you have lower you have window you have saw we think about metal you have far left you have main you have far right this is a common theme is there's usually give or take three plus doors and if there's more than three two of them are usually in a similar enough location and serve different purposes and do different things right so um the reason the way i think about the game is that in general there are two cat there's three categories of doors. The first one is a door I'm using Uber through. The second one is a door I'm not using Uber through. And the third one is sort of like a variable door that kind of does both. And a lot of the skill ceiling comes from using that third door better than other teams. Just sort of at the higher level where your skill gap comes from. Um, because everyone can push the use Uber door well and everyone can push the hold Uber door well. It's sort of using that third one well that sort of creates a skill gap. Um, so let's look at the second. There's, there's choke and sort of there's baby and there's big door. Um, Gully's a weird one because on more conventional ones, the three places are much more separated, but on this map, they condense two of the doors into one location. Um, so. To prove my point a little better, we're going to come to last just to sort of like explain the characteristics of the type of doors and why I think about them the way I do, right? So for use Uber doors, the characteristics are usually we're f giving up immediate high ground, right? Normally, goal is a weird map, right? So normally, you'll the map will make you trade proximity to the enemy for low ground. So like if we go to Snake or Sunshine, we'll come back to Gully, but. I want to show on Sunshine because it's a really good illustration of what I'm talking about. Right, there's three doors. 
top left dungeon, top right. Um, the use Uber door are usually the doors that are closest to the enemy. Because since you're using Uber, it doesn't really matter what your high ground is at the very beginning because you're invincible. Um, and this is sort of a way to think about Ubers. Is instead of thinking about Ubers as something you do while you push, you're using an Uber to move yourself into a spot you could not previously do. So for example, if you didn't have Uber and it was 6v6 and they were holding default, you could not normally just walk in top right and stand here and spawn camp them. They would try and stop you. But the power of the Uber is that you can walk through top right, walk to this door and start spawn camping them and they can't stop you because you're invincible, right? So it's thinking about Ubers like this. It's, it, it's a tool to do something you previously could not do, right? So in general, what that means is if you want to maneuver and kill things, you want to start as close to them as possible. And since it makes impossible things possible, you can give up immediate high ground, right? And this is why Dungeon is such a good illustration because it's sort of a characteristic in that you don't immediately start close to them, but the favor is you trade immediate high ground for the potential, then pop Uber in very close proximity to the other team. Um, so that's sort of the use Uber doors. And then there's not use Uber doors. Since we're not trying to use Uber, usually things that we're looking for is high vision. We want to have the ability to see things coming at us if we don't want to use Uber. So like thinking about top left, I can see everything. There's not really hiding here, right? This is good. Um, and it's also usually high ground. Um, because we don't want to use, we're dry fighting. So anytime you're dry fighting, you're looking to play from high ground. Right? TF2, we know that. Um, so oftentimes, the hold door is immediate high ground. Coming into second is also a good illustration because if we're holding Uber, we're swinging cafe because it's high ground and it's vision versus we're popping through valley because it's closer to them, but it's immediately low ground and low vision but you're trading high ground and vision for being close to them so you can use the Uber and go to a place you normally could not go without dying and kill them. Um, so we'll go back to Gully, sort of thinking about stuff like that. And we'll talk about pushing mid into second and which doors are which and sort of why. And we can start identifying those patterns. All right, so analyzing these doors again, choke sort of looks like the hold Uber door right it's high ground compared to big door it's vision it seems like a hold uber door versus coming baby door it's no vision it's low ground but it gives you proximity to the enemy right same as big door it's low ground it's low vision but you can pop through on and it's proximity to the enemy does that kind of make sense hello yeah. Does that make sense? Yep. Yes, sir. Cool. Um, so given what we know, on a hold the Uber push, there's a couple important things you guys should be thinking about. Um, first thing is the order with which your players get in is actually very significant in like the success rate of your push. Um, what I mean by that is buffing a soldier first and allowing him to burst through and sort of do the create space thing where he's seeing what's going on. He's creating space. He's creating distraction. Do I shoot soldier? Do I shoot the team following him? Decisions, mistakes, right? We know how this works. Um, the second important thing that as a demo man, when you're trying to hold Uber through chokes like this and you expect some sort of bomb on a choke is usually a good idea to live. Leave sticky. There. Now you know it's important. Stickies, right? Like when your team's pushing through this point, stickying this floor where your medic is going to walk and these soldiers are going to land will net you so many kills. And even if it doesn't net you a kill, what it does is it makes this soldier not able to just face plant on your medic because he dies, right? So now he has to do higher bomb thing that enables the soldier to see him earlier and the scout who's walking over the stickies behind the soldier to deal with that bomb much better. Like this is just something you should always be doing on any time you're getting through a choke. Like on process, for example, you should be sticking the walls of the chokes or anything that tries to get on your medic, you just dead on. Um, the floor in this instance, because that's where he's landing. 
right? Um, and then as a scout, things you're looking for is you're obviously looking for stickies as well. So rule, the rule is if your medic dies to stickies, it's your pocket scout's fault unless he's dead. Um, so even if your soldiers jump through this, right, he might not have had time to check choke because he might be fighting things. So it's always on you, the pocket scout, to make sure your medic's not about to die to stickies, right? And make sure there's not a guy hiding. Um, in case we don't know, the soldiers can chill up there. They can just sit here, in case you didn't know. And then they can get really high. And then they can kill things. Um, so clear that. It's like Batman on Metalworks. It's just good to know that exists. Um, so yeah. So that's sort of what we're looking at as sort of a dry put. We're looking to hold the Uber. The ordering goes. We saw on our soldier. He gets bucked. He's through. Is there anything immediately close he's shooting? Nah. What else is there? Right? Drawing eyes, diverting, jumping into rock. To you can jump through. Oops. You can jump and then land on the rock. Right? And this is a good spot. Gives you good spam angles. It gives you control. It gives you vision. Right? Solid. And you can get arrowed by your medic from choke. It's just great. Um, and then scout's coming through. And you're looking for stickies. And you're looking for high. And you're making sure your medic's not about to die. Your demo man's being patient, waiting his turn. Demo man comes through. Medic comes through. Bam, we're in the second. Um, let's talk about using Uber pushes. And there's sort of a couple. We'll start with the two big ones. Um, the most common. So this requires previous knowledge. But teams that know they have disadvantage are going to be playing. Whoops, in river. Push the talking and jumping is hard. Um, if they know they have this at, they're going to be playing in river. So this is sort of another reason why choke is usually not a good use the Uber choke to get through. Because unless they're sitting here on disad, um, it's just impossible. Versus if you have ad, right? So it's ad, you're pushing, and you're coming through choke, and you see they're all here, do not be afraid to use the Uber to kill them, right? Like that's acceptable if they're still holding close. But most of the time, teams who are disad and know they're disadvantaged will be playing in river. Um, Given that we know they're going to do this, one of the best ways to use an Uber to kill a medic. Oh, so there's something I left out that's important. Um, well, I don't know if I actually want to talk about that. So we'll talk about it like this. Understanding there's certain like Uber thresholds that are important and sort of categorize different types of pushes. Right. So for example, on Ubers that are 30% or less advantage usually means you're trying to kill the medic because the window you have before they get Uber is very small. So you need to use the Uber to kill the medic and then win, right? If that makes sense. Versus on Uber advantages that are like bigger than 30, maybe even above 40, you can look to try and hold the Uber through a transition, right? Because the f if they're smart, they try and run up on you here, you're going to kill them with Uber, right? So if they're smart, they're not going to be playing. And given they're not playing in, they're not really able to stop you from coming and choke for free. The sort of the gamble on holding an Uber, right? So instead of using bigger ads, like things bigger than 40 and trying to hold them, the objective is you take the free point. The threat of a fight without Uber makes these teams leave, right? So at, if any point you're progressing through, like a, a second or a last point or mid on any map and you have uber ad and you're doing the thing where we have so much ad we could probably take this point for free and then still use the ad to win last um if you're doing that you're fighting the clock on the uber ad right so you can think of uber percentages as timers so let's say 100 percent of an uber at most at the least amount of time you can build an uber is 40 seconds that's maximal building so assuming your team, the enemy team is perfect, so you're like, assuming they're perfect prevents you from making a lot of dumb mistakes. So I always assume the enemy team is building flawlessly. And so what that means is that you can break sort of Uber thresholds down into like second differences. So teams that have 30% ad will mean the first team that gets Uber will have a third of 40 seconds to try and kill the other team before they also get Uber and they no longer have advantage, so stings start stalemating, right? When both teams have equal resources of Uber and players, for example, 
you start stalemating because neither team can push forward or backward because it's even. So you're trying to avoid that because you're trying to win. Um, and so you're thinking about these sort of timing windows you, you have with ad. And knowing the timing windows means certain things are possible. So like, I know that if I try and push choke on only 20% ad, which is one fifth of 40, which is about eight, right? Eight times, five times 40 is eight, right? Am I crazy? I can do basic math, I think. So you have about eight seconds, right? So if you try in those eight seconds to take this point for free, by the time you get to second, Ubers will be even. And that means you had an advantage and didn't capitalize. So that was a bad decision. Versus we know we have a small time window. And if we're going to capitalize, we need to use it to kill the medic. So we do more extreme things to kill the medic because that makes sense, right? So this is sort of learning to bracket Uber percentages into sort of option pools, right? So things greater than 40% are usually a go through a hold Uber door versus things below 40% ad, like 30 or less, you're going through a use Uber door to kill the enemy team with the Uber and try and kill the medic and continue rolling that advantage you had. Um, are we with me? Does that make sense? Is my yeah, right? yeah, okay, cool. yes, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so, um, let's talk about the Uber pushes. We sort of mentioned one. So these are below 30% Ubers, right? Sort of. There's a special one I'll talk about in a second. But the main less then try and take second for free percentages. So like the 30 and below rain is a double soldier through big door catching the medic in river, right? Knowing what we know about how they're going to be positioning in river, you can come big door with two soldiers, make them invincible, have them jump into this team here. If you're not a noob like me, you can make that jump much. Better. So again, actually, so we'll explain things we already know. This is really strong because it's blind. The scouts don't see you immediately jumping, right? So you can just get flashed. And you end up really deep in this team, killing this medic with two soldiers. Eight rockets, close range, 800 damage. That guy's dying, right? Um, if you both hit your shots. So this is a very common use Uber door situation, right? 30% ad. We know they're playing close. We give up initial high ground for proximity to enemy. Use the Uber to kill the enemy because we're close. Um, you follow me? Does that all make sense? Yes. Cool. So... The next part that sort of breaks the rule is that you're sort of in that middle ground of it's not so ridiculously fat, like it's not 60% ad where you can stroll your way into second and then take it into last because you have so much time. It's a lot closer. It's like 40, like 35 to 50, like not a whole lot of time, like less than 15 to 20 seconds. Like you don't have that much time to take second and then get into last, but it's enough time that you can do something a little juicier. The juicy idea is that Given what we know that they're playing in river, you can try and come lobby. Okay, so first thing, when you're as a scout or any player who's about to walk into wood, every time you're about to walk into wood, walk into this corner. The main reason is that, well, first, make sure there's no stickies on the floor, right? Because the thing we're afraid of is a demo man being in this lobby and just having stickies on the shutter and you open them and you die for no reason, right? That's what we're afraid of. So as we're approaching the shutter door, make sure they're not immediately on the floor. And then after you do that, tuck into this corner and see where this demo man is. Any stickies he have he has up top here cannot kill you. And any demo man who is watching a trap sees the shutter door open, the player on his screen next to his stickies, he's deading like 100% of the time. Like every time he sees this, he's deading. Shutter open, player on screen, stickies, mouse two. Um, and they don't hurt you, so you can bait the debt here a lot. So all that being said, if we're considering doing this like 35 to 50% Uber ad play, if we come into this door and there's a demo man, it's immediately over and we're just trying to take this shit for free because they've conceded any aggressive demo man positioning in order to lock out lobby. They really don't want you getting behind. You take what you're given. All right, it's ad, we take second and then we try and do some sack things on last. But if the demo man is dead or you check and the demo man's not here, you know they're in river. You can take a double scout through wood into their last, and the rotation you're beating is into this river, right? So knowing that they're playing river, right, they're here. If they aren't ready, you're running double scout behind them. If you beat them to this door, 
they don't get to leave last, and then there's two Ubered scouts running at them from behind. Does this sort of make sense? Are we following me? Well, yes. That's, what, that's sort of, yeah. So we understand why this is good. The second thing is what your explosives are looking to do is be patient in the beginning. The worst thing you can do as an explosive, not in an Uber, is make yourself a target, right? Because you're about to become invincible. So the worst thing you can do is give them something to shoot, right? Because the best outcome is you're invincible and you're doing damage to them and they're doing zero damage to you and then you win the fight because that's just how the game works, right? Versus if you give them something to shoot, they'll shoot not the invincible players and sort of stay even in terms of damage exchange. Like they can Uber and then you can die and make the Uber bad just by being in too far. So as an explosive, you're executing patience and you're chilling. You're making sure no flanks are happening. You're a demo in big door. You're making sure nothing's happening. Oh, this is an important thing. Um, while they're doing this as a demo man, you can lay stickies on the front of the shutter and lock the defending team out of their lobby from the front side. This is a powerful idea that we'll see when we talk about sacks here in a second. Um, but yeah, so this is sort of what you're doing as a demo. As explosives, there's two soldiers are chilling choke, right? Uh, wait, does that do it? No, it doesn't do it. But your soldiers are over there. Your demos, these sticking shutter doors. Um, our players are getting behind. Our scouts are executing this Uber. And while our scouts are shooting things and calming what's happening, once the Uber's been popped as an explosive, you're waiting for like, you know how like at the very beginning of the Uber, it's really chaotic and there's not a clear thing that's going on, but like a little bit later, there'll be something that's been hurt enough that someone will be like, okay, shoot this thing. Once it sort of feels like there's a target, all your explosives are looking to jump the front side of the river. So to recap what's happening, there's two Uber scouts running from behind into a team caught river. And there's three explosive classes jumping into the mouth of river and they're just fucked. Um, again, this is sort of a very variation and sort of, as I was talking about earlier, this is sort of the third weird door that isn't a hold or use. And this is where the skill gaps is generated. So I wanted to open your eyes to this possibility of beating teams to rotations and using Ubers like that. Um, that's very hard and low probability, but it's something you should know exists. Your bread and butter are going to be big ad, don't pop, push the choke. Small ad, kill medic, double soldier, big door. Things happen. Maybe if they're in lobby, you can just Uber into lobby and kill them, right? But you're looking to get close. Forgo high, high ground for being close to them and use Uber to kill them. I'm going to talk about a couple sack variations because sacking from mid into second is actually very hard. Um, the first one I want to teach is getting players behind in lobby. And the way this works is you keep a pocket choke and everyone who's not that pocket rotates out to big door. What we're doing here is we're trying to set up a situation where our demo man has stickies on this shutter door, locking out the enemy team from their own lobby. We follow, we're pushing, these are even Ubers. So we're doing, that's why we're sacking. Cause if it's not even, we're not sacking. We're doing something else. Even Ubers, they're holding choke. You know how teams do. What we're doing is we're rotating everyone but our pocket soldier into this big door, bullying anything that's here, locking them out of the shutter as our demo men, and then getting something behind. And then this player behind can treat this as a wall because nothing's coming from there without him knowing. And so now you've separated the map into lots of little pockets for where a scout can be taking 1v1s. Um, and so what that also means is that the player behind knows where everyone is always. There's never worry about this guy coming through Shutter without being known. So if there's a guy who's died, you know he's on this side of the map. And if he hasn't died yet while you're sacking, you know he's on that side of the map. So you know where all your players are. So again, flank scout or flank soldier is getting behind. The player behind is looking to either A, pull enough players to where your team can favorably fight, higher level idea, or lower level idea, take 1v1s while behind. Um, because it's better than jumping into seven players and dying. Um, from having someone behind, you can try and take a sort of a fight and make them move. So for example, wherever their beam is, you go the other door and start fighting. So it makes them move. And then while they're moving, again, decisions, mistakes. While they're making decisions and mistakes, you're getting the player that's behind in as a sack. Um, so executing big door like this, 
and getting players behind and controlling their shutter from the team that's holding is a very powerful idea. Um, the other sort of thing you can try and do is you can try and just sack a roamer, someone through chat, right? And we know how good that goes. So learning to use the big door is a very powerful idea and strategy. Um, so we've pushed into second. Let's talk about holding it and sort of what we want that to look like. On even Ubers, demo man's here. What you're doing is completely controlling river. We want no nonsense with soldiers and scouts peeking the shit. They want to peek it. They're going to catch the trap to the face. You're locking this out. This is your turf. You have your pocket soldier always watching lower. So that way, this player, like the most dangerous part of this map is when players get behind you through wood without you knowing they're there. Um, that's a very easy way for your medic to force or die. So knowing that's the most dangerous thing, we're just going to assign the person who never has to go anywhere just to watch the shit. Um, and then we keep our flanks or pocket scout here if we want. Um, the second part of this is we have a soul a scout and a medic also here. Um, reason we do this is because every sack on earth into this last, the soldier has to go water or through river just because like the demo man's trapping everything else. He's going to be trapping launch pad. He's going to be trapping shutter. Like he'll be trapping this thing. Like it's very difficult for you to get in on a sack without there being something else going on and you going through river. So knowing that we know that. We push. We just put our soldier here, just because he's going to be here anyway. Um, from here, there's two important. So this is on evens hold, right? We understand how evens work. So we're going to talk about sacking now, because that's sort of the next step that happens. Um, there's two variations that I think are sort of going to be your bread and butter. The first one is the classic scout go water play point. They have to make a decision about fighting the scout. They make mistakes while the mistakes are going. Our soldiers are getting in, right? Multiple things, multiple things, like things they have to think about, the decisions, mistakes, all that good shit. The sort of evolved version of that play is you go double water, and then you have to be quick. So soldiers, you have to burn HP to jump. You're flat jumping across, getting with your scout, and then threatening winning the game off capping. When this happens, there's a couple things that can happen. The first thing you can expect to happen is the We'll try and shoot you because you're winning the game. So things are going to come like this to stop you from winning. The whole bait of this play is that when things start dropping to the floor as a soldier, you're looking to jump over this rim into this medic. Um, so that's sort of the leveled up version of the water play. Is you threaten to win, they drop, you jump, medic. Um, a big important thing team play wise that everyone should know is that the more doors this comes back to decisions and mistakes. The more doors you engage the enemy from while your soldier is in and sacking, the more likely it is someone could do some sort of supporting amount of damage. Because very often, a soldier can jump in, do something from 80 to 100 damage, and just not force. But while he's jumping in, there's a demo man shooting pills. There's a soldier shooting spam rockets. That 30 to 50 damage is so critical. Because imagine you're a medic, and there's a soldier who, while this, this soldier's in the air, hits you for 30, your HP blow, goes below 100, and now all of a sudden you have to start considering if you're popping. right? If it's just one soldier, you know for a fact this dude will shoot you in the face once for max damage and you won't die, so you're sitting pretty on this Uber. right? You're guaranteed taking one rocket, you don't even have to think about it. Versus, if there's 30 to 50 damage going on in this fight, you're making decisions, you're making mistakes. So that's sort of why you want to be peeking doors while your sack's going on. Um, so we talked about even holding and sacks. So now I want to talk about disadvantage holding. For example, after a double sack. So let's assume you have Uber. If you have Uber, but you're at player disadvantage, the way you're going to set up is you're going to have your soldiers sitting at, at the point where both stairs and river meet. Because then he's reduced two pathways into one, and he can watch the one to control both. Right. What your medic is doing is sitting here beaming him, and if the soldier feels like it is a worthwhile exchange, he will call to use, and then you will exchange. Um, while this river thing's going on, what your demo is looking to do is lock out both of these shutters. <clears throat> Bro, I need something to drink. I've been talking for a brick. But 
he stickies these doors and makes sure things aren't getting in through here. So this is a wall. The only choice they have is to come through river and your boy's sitting with an Uber in it. What your scout is doing is wherever the pressure is, you're playing rotate. If it's river, you're sitting here shooting river, whatever is happening. If it's something pressuring your demo, you're dropping and helping your demo. Right? You're playing flex, you're playing rotate. This is where normally pocket scout is all about being the most important thing. But here, you're off the beam, you're playing support, you're playing to rotate and help where it needs. And this is sort of the second, the thing I was talking about earlier about being like a high school player. is understanding your role and letting other players shine when it's better for them to be doing that. Um, <clears throat> This sort of this makes sense. Like, are we following why we're doing this and why this is good? Yeah, yeah. But let's talk about pushing. So knowing what we know, there's a couple things that immediately stand out. It feels like if I want to use an Uber, this door is not only closer, but also a high ground. So it feels really confusing to me when I see a lot of teams trying to pop smaller Uber ads through River just because it's low ground and far away. Um, the second thing I want everyone to know about this last is that if there's a pyro and an NG with a gun in the corner, it is virtually impossible to push this river with an Uber. It just is. Like this dude's fucking your whole day up, and then you somehow kill this buff player. And then there's a whole gun that you have to deal with. Your Uber's just done. And then you're in a nice enclosed low ground spot where the whole enemy team is shooting you and you're dying. Right? So, if they ever have time to set up, you really have to be careful of river. Like, really, really be careful, because this shit will fuck you all the time. Um, also, now that you know this, this is sort of the way you really want to be trying to set up on Uber Disad. Because if they go, like, okay, your pyro doesn't play, your pyro plays here. It was illustrative, right? As a pyro, you're sitting here because you have access to all the doors, and you can be wherever you need to be. But the idea is that there's a gun, and a pyro comes in and shits on the Uber in this mouth of the doorway. Even if he ends up dying, there's a whole gun in a corner you have to deal with. And while you're shooting this gun, the rest of the team is at your back, right? So this is mad dangerous. So if you can, and they've had time to set up, avoid the river. That being said, what river accomplishes that's very good is it gives Demo a quick avenue into the team. Versus through Shutter, his jump is not as good and it's telegraphed. Versus if you're trying to surprise players, so you have players, it's like river's really good at rolling where you have ad. So You've won of you've convincingly won second and they're leaving and they don't have Uber ad, but you do. You come river quickly to engage the demo as fast as possible. He puts a sticky down, you pop, your demo gets in, and your demo immediately becomes effective at killing the medic. Right. So this is sort of the way you should be thinking about river. It is not a slow push. It is we're jumping our demo, so we're going there push. Right. So this is there's two different use doors that are sort of very different than what you expect them to be. That's why I was saying goalie was like a weird map. It like, doesn't really make sense. They're in last, there's usually not a hold the Uber door because you have Uber, you use Uber, and you win the round, right? It's just nonsensical to like hold the Uber and win the round. Um, that being said, there are some situations in last that are big enough. For example, process or sunshine or sunshine top left, you can sort of walk in, gauge, and then use advantage. Um, Gully, there's no equivalent. Gully is so small that there's no there's no freebies. You're popping through all the doors that you're getting into last. Um, it's just the way it is. It's part of the map. Um, that being said, I want to talk sort of about the structure of this shutter door Uber. And this structure is a pattern that exists in a lot of different Ubers that sort of work in a similar idea. It's sort of the category of scout demo Uber where the demo is not really looking to jump. So you can think of these like shutter top right and snake, shutter here. Um, let me think process one. Right? These are Ubers where your demo, or five, for example, where your demo is not looking to jump, but it's a scout and demo in the Uber. The way the pattern works is that you lead on your scout. <gasps> there you go, excuse me. You lead on your scout. The scout comes through. In situations where your demo can jump and can create his own distance and space, you lead on him. But in doorways where a demo man could be juggled, you want to have a scout sort of be a body in front of the door at the beginning of the Uber. It creates a pocket behind the Uber for your demo man to get in with. Right. So we pop through on our scout. He leads. Same thing with Snake. Same thing with Process 5. 
right, Scott leads. He's creating a pocket. The demo's walking in his sort of wake behind him. Then what we're looking to do is if anything's in our way, we're looking to maneuver here, right? Thinking back to Uber as maneuvers that you couldn't previously do. What we're looking to do that was previously impossible is stroll through shutter, spawn camp them, and play point. That's sort of what we're imagining here. So our scout leads through first. Our demo's behind. What our demo's looking to do is there's anything that's here is dying. But the important thing that a lot of them will skip, and I really want to emphasize this, is that it's really, really important with the last three to four stickies in your clip, you lock out the shutter door. Don't immediately turn them. Even if there's no players here, it's important that you lock the shutter out. And the reason that's really important is that you guarantee for your soldiers where these players are coming. And the second thing it does is it stagnates the impact of the fight. And what I mean is let's think about who's doing things that are important, right? You have Scout. He's clearing space. But then Demo comes in. Demo's doing damage. Demo Sticky's door, right? By this time, we're playing point, and they're starting to come out top left. Now it's Soldier's turn to be important because they're jumping in on this tight little choke, shooting anything that's top left. But now it's your Demo's turn to be reloading. Because either they all die top left and you've won, or you sticky top right, start reloading. Your soldiers are fighting top left. You don't immediately kill them all. But since you've been patient, you've stickied this door. Nothing's flanking. You've guaranteed where they all are. You've maximized your soldier damage. The second part of that is that you're now reloading. So again, they either instantly die to your soldiers, or you're a fully loaded demo with players your soldiers just hit for, hit for eight rockets. Right? You're just going to melt anything that's alive. So understanding this like ammo management principle of staggering the am demo ammo early and then late into the fight and having the soldiers collapse in the middle ground is like common throughout the game. Um, snake water top right works like that, right? We can imagine walk through top right, right? Same idea. We push through top right. And the only difference is that instead of ending here, we're ending, we're walking up a ramp and ending left on point. The demo man is still coming right. He's still using the last of his ammo to sticky. He's still reloading. All the players are still funneled through top left towards truck. Your soldiers are still mulching them, and your demo will still be loaded after the mulch. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's a very common pattern. And when you understand how this works and understand the value of maximizing your soldiers and your demo reloads and then shoots hurt things in the post, you're off to a great start. So coming back to skill gap and using the third door kind of weirdly, there's a very strong double scout Uber through main you can do on small ads to kill medics. Um, and very often, even if they have a pyro, you can slip the Uber past the pyro before he's able to like stuff you in the door. So this is kind of a, an interesting anti-pyro strategy because you have two scouts who are Ubered. So they can come in, kill this, mu this Muppet, and then come top right and kill Medic. Um, so again, the use Uber doors and then the skill ceiling third door. Uh, do we want me to talk about holding or do we are we kind of confident about how that works okay so i'll talk about it um important things to note is that as soldiers in this lap during even ubers the most influential thing you can do on the game is court take your buffs in the lobby and peak launch down and main respectively together the things this does for you is a it it's better than you sitting over here and negatively trading spam in river, right? So immediately puts you, oops, immediately puts you high ground, which is good. Um, the second thing is it does is it's buffing you and then getting you away from your medic so your medic can tank your demo and scout. The third thing it's doing is giving you not only vision, so like when you're picking this together, if you can, you basically know where everything is because if it's not here, it's probably in fucking river, right? So you can see what's here. If it's not here, it's there. So you know where everything is. And the other part of this that's very powerful is that you're just going to kill shit. Like that player drop down. So if you're the shutter soldier, usually the pocket, you're playing more baity. And the roamer, usually in launch pad, is going to be the one who's more aggressively peeking and relaying to this guy what's going on. And then this guy will then peek with what's going on here. And that's where the teamwork comes in. And this as soldiers, this is like a very powerful pattern on this last. So anytime on evens, your soldiers should be looking to coordinate that. Um, as a demo man, there's a couple options. If you're disad, playing in water is very strong. Um, you can stick you the inside of this rim, and you come down here, 
and you can sticky that and then you can sit here and watch it. Um, and then anything that wants to come down here has to walk past this corner, but then it's hard for them to like get an angle and knock these stickies away from the corner. Cause right. Okay. They shoot the floor. It knocks them down, but they're still in the corner to actually knock them away. They have to peek pretty deep. And if they're doing that, you're not just going to let them do that. You're shooting them with pills. So you're defending yourself water. You have stickies on the rim and coming back to explosives, making themselves not a target. The less you can get shot while the enemy team is Ubering or your team is Ubering and you're not in the Uber, usually the better the decision ends up being. Um, right. So for example, as a defending team, right. So we know they're disad. Let me finish what I'm saying. I'm getting sidetracked. So on even Ubers, these soldiers looking to work together. Um, on even Ubers, your demo is looking to play up here with his team. He can sticky a whole bunch of things. He's just looking to aggressively sticky these chokes. Um, make sure nothing, anything that peaks that shit gets punished, right? Um, and he's looking mostly just to out the way. Pocket Scout, you're protecting your medic. Oops. There you go. Pocket Scout. Looking to protect your medic. You know how that go. Um, that's how that should go. Flank Scout, you can be looking to snipe or play heavy or off class. Off classes are very strong in this last, so. Uh, um. <clears throat> As for disad though, so talk, coming back to what we were talking about earlier, where soldiers jumping behind enemy Ubers is better than them just sitting there and getting shot. When I was reviewing, um, what was his name? The guy with the pink profile picture, I think, with the penguin or something. What was his name? I just reviewed him, Brute F or something. Frosty. There you go, Frosty. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm very high, so you'll have to forgive me for mis fucking up the name. Um, right on disad. As an explosive, you're looking to minimize the amount of time you're getting shot, right? Because that's just free money. So demo man, you're looking, you're hiding in water with trapping yourself off. So anything that wants to get into you is committing through traps somewhere. So it usually means they have to burn a flash to get into you. Um, so that's usually good. Um, <clears throat> soldiers, right? When you see an Uber popping, the worst thing you can do is sit here and try and juggle it. Um, you're much better off jumping in the lobby and fighting or jumping over the uber river and fighting river so they're ubering and you're jumping over them and you're fighting the soldier here or you're doing that from drop down right so you're the roaming soldier here ubers happen immediately oops you're immediately jumping the uber and fighting river um yeah and then you're looking not to die and rotate the spawn on this ad any sort of questions about how holding works? No. I think that's kind of just Goldie Watch. Is there any like questions or things I forgot to address? Um, I have questions. So, please. How 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 good would you say is sniper on last? From because from my experience, it doesn't like on on defending. Like if you're defending and then like it's just something. That's, no. It's free. So like the reason people do it is it's no cost. So pro versus con, right? The worst thing that can happen is you just reset. Versus the pro is if something peaks you, it's a pick. If he's playing heavy, to be effective, he has to risk his body. Um, NG is also very good because it's free Uber percentage you're eating. You build a gun, you run away from the gun, they shoot the gun with their Uber, and you're safe, right? So sniper is good because it's safe and free. So if something picks, Right, that's fantastic. If nothing happens, he switches off and has been safe and not immediately shot in the Uber. Also, just having a sniper forces them to pop through doors. So, something to think about. All right. Thank you. Of course. Anything else? Um, so, my team likes to put a soldier on top of the rim above the point on last hold. That's holds. very strong. I, it's good when you're dealing with things in water on even, it's like a power position in the point, right? Because as soldier, oops, as soldier, it's high ground and there's no wall for you to get shot at, right? Like there's no splash wall. Um, mm. So it's very strong, but during even, I think this lobby thing is very powerful. But that being said, if a scout, this brings up a good point. If the scout goes water here, your roamer immediately has to rotate out from whatever he's and chill on and watch this like this um okay. so that's very strong also as a team as a soldier pushing the last that's sort of a thing to be jumping into right so again 
if your team is pushing into the last, worst thing you can do is jump in r immediately the same time as the Uber and give them a target that's not invincible. So you're looking to chill, at least until the Uber's over. Once the Uber's last 20% ending, you're looking then to try and get into power positions, right? So if the Uber's through shutters gone well, we're guaranteeing they're playing top left. There's a couple players you can play that's good at dealing with top left, right? This is one. And the crates on the left is good. I fucked the straight up. But you know what I'm saying, right? Good position for dealing with left. Um. This one's also a very good one. It feels super slow, but what you're looking to do is stay and then you're getting into whatever, right? Like you're one away from anything that matters in this last, right? So a couple of good positions to be jumping into or out of on that last. Good question. Is there anything else? Um, countersacking, countersacking. Oh, sure. How can we create pressure? For the soldier getting in, what's the most effective way? Because like, when you counter sack, it can't just be like, well, sending in one person is fine because you don't risk anything else. But usually, you don't get anything off of just a single soldier going into five people. Right. So, a lot of similar things apply, but the most important difference I think you can make to making your counter sacks better is reaction time to the sack dying. Really high skill soldiers, when they notice. And by the way, this is something else you can start implementing, is that very often times, the best soldier to counter sack is the pocket. Because that's the one that's just sitting on the beam and sitting at 300. So a lot of the times on my teams, what I'll tell them is that if we're counter sacking, just send my pocket every time. Because um, what's going to happen a lot of the time is there's going to be a sack that happens, right? It starts coming in big door. This pocket soldier sees it. The fast this soldier counter sacks the more likely he is to catch them not in a comfortable position right because if we're thinking about sacking through big door we're rotating our medic into an uncomfortable position in order to like enable a play this is true for a lot of different things most of the time when you're pressuring for a sack it entails moving your medic so what you're trying to exploit from that is by being quick you're trying to catch them in a movement in a rotation where they're not comfortable um and the second thing is there's no glamorous answer to your question. It's just going to be down, dirty, peeking chokes that are getting shot. Like, that's just going to be part of counter sacking. There's no real, like, sweet thing I can say that will instantly make you better. It's going to be a lot of getting tanked and shooting. Um, I wish I could give you a more glamorous answer than that, but there really isn't one. Counter sacking is just dirty. You just do it as quick as you can, and you do as much damage for the guy who's dying as you can without dying yourself. It's just kind of the thing that happens. Um, but things we touched on earlier that are relevant is diversity of door. So again, more doors you can peek while the counter sack or just before the counter sack happens, um, even slightly after too. Again, any 30 to 50 damage you can get on the medic that makes him think, it just increases your sack like success exponentially. So that's kind of what I would say about counter sacking. Um, do it quickly um, and do it with the healthiest soldier that you can. And then look to diversify the doors you're spamming through and expect a lot of resistance because there's usually going to be anything else I can talk about. Uh, do you have do you have anything about like offensive off classing on like last like pyro and water or something? Offensive off classing, so like set plays, like creative set plays. So like yeah, are you as a pyro as a sack, is what you're saying? Uh no, like just pyro goes in water with as a defender or something uh oh, the, the, so you're saying as uh, on the piece. offense yeah, yeah yeah so we're saying the same thing i got you okay. yeah stuff like pyro um, heavy shit like that so a very common pattern that i think is good to learn is that if it's a last where it makes sense right this is high high level stuff again but there are certain situations and certain maps that promote exchanges as a strong option from the aggressive team and what you can do is you can send a sack the sack doesn't work, the soldier comes up on heavy, you exchange, and then you have a heavy of your own fighting in the post. Um, so that's a common aggressive off-classing tactic that works a lot of the time. Um, another one is like spy immediately after uh, like a collapse. And what I mean is you're using the spy 
because you know they're going to be moving forward. So instead of using the spot as an infiltration, you're more planting the spy, knowing they're going to be moving through a choke. So what I mean is like, is if they're in a transition, let me get rid of Um, What I mean by that is like, let's say for example, for whatever reason, we lost one of our flank or someone died and we have to leave second and we're retreating into mid and we know we're also going to have to give up mid. Having that scout come up as like that thing died as a spy is like a very way, it's like a strong, aggressive off class. But it's not aggressive as in you're going into them. It's aggressive as in you're off-classing to generate an advantage. Defensive teams are not looking to generate anything. They're looking to stay neutral or maintain advantage. Versus aggressive teams are looking to generate the advantage, right? So it's not in last, but it sort of answers your question. And then having a spot come up off of like people who die in transition and then post up where you know they have to gun through. And then stopping point or killing a medic is very strong. But most of the time, the, the one that fits your description the best is usually the heavy exchange strat, which happens a lot, where you'll have sack waves happen, nothing is successful. You have a heavy come up, you exchange, and then fight posts with the enemy team, hopefully using Uber to jockey for position and enabling the heavy to be high value in the post fight. I guess there's something else important I should talk about, is that it's not just about what you're doing in the Uber, it's what comes after the Uber and the post positioning that also matters. Like a lot. So, for example, even if you have an amazing, amazing Uber, you pop through, you kill two important things. If you end the Uber here, it's very difficult to win because your the incoming to outcoming damage ratio is bad for you. Versus, if you have a slightly worse Uber, you only kill one thing that matters. But all their players are on the low ground and all your players are on the high ground, then you win the fight. Right? It's not going to be quite as extreme as that. But learning to end the Uber in some sort of Positional advantage will net you a lot more win than just all inning the Uber and then losing. Oh yeah, that's something important I want to talk about. What's up, Frosty? You joined like right at the end after we finish. Yeah. Yeah, I had to go make rice. I'm sorry. No worries. You had to go make lice? Rice. Meat slice? Meat slice. <laughs> That's no, a lot no. of rice, goddamn. That's an industrial oh. amount of rice. <laughs> that was so fun. Okay, you put the rice in the rice cooker, right? And you like do it, right? And, but 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 